Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's program on suing Nazis with Integrity First for America. I'm Ari Goldstein with the Office of the President at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Our work at the museum primarily concerns the Nazis and Nazism of the 1930s and 40s. But as we all know, the racist, anti-Semitic ideology, symbols, and language of the original Nazism endure 75 years after the Nazi party dissolved in 1945. The challenge of uh, perhaps at any time since the end of the war. The museum has hosted Integrity First for America for a few programs since 2018 because the work that they're doing to confront and dismantle contemporary Nazism through the courts is so unique and potentially precedent setting. So today we'll hear from Integrity First's Amy Spitalnik and from Michael Block about Signs v. Kessler, the federal lawsuit against the organizers of the August 2017 march in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is scheduled to go to trial this October. I'll give them both brief introductions before we get started. Amy Spitalnik is the Executive Director of Integrity First for America. She also has over a decade of experience in government, including as Communications Director and Senior Policy Advisor to New York Attorney General Barbara Underwood, and as an advisor and spokesperson for New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. Joining us along with Amy is Michael Block, who serves as counsel at Kaplan, Hecker, and Fink, and as a lead attorney in Signs v. Kessler. Mike is an experienced trial attorney who has spent over seven years as a public defender at the Bronx Defenders, and three years as a litigation associate at Williams and Connolly LLP before joining Kaplan Hecker. Mike has also served as a law clerk for two federal judges and is currently a member of the New York City Bar Association's Criminal Justice Operations Committee and Mass Incarceration Task Force. Members, please feel free to share questions for Amy and Mike throughout today's program via the Zoom chat, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can towards the end of the presentation. Lastly, I wanna remind everyone tuning in that programs like this are only possible thanks to your support. So we will be very grateful if you can visit the museum's website and join as members or donate to support our work. Without further ado, welcome Amy and Michael, and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks, Thanks so much, Ari. Um, it's always great to partner with the museum. The museum has been an absolutely fantastic partner um, as we get out the word about this case and try to highlight the um, rise of modern day extremism. Um, and sadly, this is an issue that is not going away and that one and is one that has only become more urgent in recent years. Um, I think there's so much worth sharing in terms of the rise of white supremacy and hate. I'll try to give you a little bit of an overview and then Mike and I will really dive into the case where it stands and how it fits into this broader landscape. Um, but no one who's watching I think would be surprised to know that right-wing extremism, anti-Semitism, racism, and other forms of hate are on the rise in dramatic numbers in recent years. We know that right-wing extremists killed more people in 2018 than any year since 1995, which was the year of the Oklahoma City bombing. We know that anti-Semitic incidents across the board um, have been rising. And in fact, just the other week, the Anti-Defamation League came out with its latest audit of anti-Semitic incidents, showing the highest level of anti-Semitic incidents on record since they started tracking. Um, for the year 2019. And certainly, um, we can all agree that that's disturbing, but sadly unsurprising to many of us who've been following this for some time. And what happened in Charlottesville two and a half years ago was not an isolated incident in this rise of hate, but rather part of this much larger cycle of a flashpoint in the cycle of white supremacist extremism. I think it's worth remembering what exactly happened. And Mike will go into this in much greater detail as he describes the case, but it's easy to forget that two and a half years ago, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and, other, and hate groups descended on an American city, wielding weapons, chanting Nazi slogans. First, on August 11th, they descended on the University of Virginia. They surrounded peaceful counter-protesters at the Thomas Jefferson statue. They threw fuel, lit torches, beat them up chanting things like Jews will not replace us and blood and soil. Um, an interfaith vigil that was being held a few blocks away had to shelter in place. Uh, then the next day, the violence continued in ways that 
many of us vividly remember. First, they descended on downtown Charlottesville. They were there under the guise of protesting the removal of a Confederate statue, but as Michael detailed, that's not in fact what their purpose was. First, they surrounded the local synagogue, um, which was having Shabbat services. The synagogue, they were chanting things like Sieg Heil. They were talking online about, quote, torching those Jewish monsters. They were carrying semi-automatic weapons. The synagogue had to evacuate people and Torahs out the back. And I know I've shared this story with um, folks at the museum before, the, the story that gets me, and this is in our lawsuit, um, is that among the Torahs the synagogue was home to was a Holocaust scroll that had been saved from Nazi Germany. And decades later, in 2017, in an American city, this Holocaust scroll was once again under Nazi threat. And that, you know, gets me every time and I think truly indi is indicative of the horror of the moment that we're living in and the opportunity to fight back. And then we know how the day culminated with the now infamous car attack in which James Fields drove his car into a crowd of peaceful counter protesters, killing Heather Heyer, injuring many others, including a number of our plaintiffs. And as Mike will describe in just a few moments, it's important to understand that none of this was an accident. This was planned for months in advance on social media. And so on behalf of 10 plaintiffs who were injured in this violence, at Integrity First for America, we're taking the leaders and the groups responsible for the violence to court we are scheduled for trial this October, and we are proceeding full steam ahead to ensure accountability and justice for our plaintiffs and for the community of Charlottesville. I'm gonna pass it to Mike now to give an overview of the case um, and bring you up to speed on where things stand because certainly in the last two and a half years since we first filed this case, there has been no shortage of developments. And even in the last 24 hours, we've gotten um, some imp pretty good, important news in the case. So Mike, if you can give us an overview of the case and where things stand. Yeah, thanks, Amy. And thank you, Ari, for having us. Um, so yeah, as Amy describes, the, the thrust of our suit generally is that none of what happened in Charlottesville was an accident. It was all meticulously, carefully planned on social media, particularly Discord, which is a gaming platform that um, generally is used by people to play video games. but um, in this case was used by kind of the most prominent white nationalists in America who created um, private invite only servers to plan really every aspect, not just of the rally, but also of the violence that, that eventuated the rally. Um, they talked about uniforms. They talked about specifically wearing black because um, blood doesn't show on black. They talked about, they posted videos of fighting tactics they had target lists. They talked about whether or not it's legal to run over counter protesters in Virginia. They had medics in place. They had lawyers in place um, for everything they knew that would, would follow after the fact. Um, they specifically studied what they could get away with under Virginia law without receiving assault charges, in their words. Um, and so everything that happened that weekend was not only carefully planned, but also as is um, something that, that we're required to prove under Ku Klux Klan Act, which is the statute that we sued under, which I, which I can talk about. Um, it was all, as you might imagine, racially and anti-Semitically motivated violence. They were very explicit about um, who, who their enemies were, who their targets were. It was um, primarily Jewish people, also black people. Um, uh, at racial, religious minorities across the board. So we brought suit under, as I mentioned, what's called the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871, which is one of the civil rights statutes, which requires that we show that what happened was a conspiracy to commit racially motivated violence, which I think is what, is what the evidence amply supports. Um, the um, in terms of where the case is now, um, we have survived a motion to dismiss that was um, back in 2018. Um, and so from that point forward, we entered into discovery. Um, discovery has been a challenge to say the least. As, as you might imagine, um, Nazis and white supremacists don't willingly cooperate with federal court orders. Um, so we, we served our 
discovery requests in January of 2018, um, which basically sought all of the evidence in addition to, to what we knew was online and in, in the form of Discord and other social media platforms, we, we sought their cell phones, their email accounts, their um, other social media platforms that we knew they used to, to plan the rally and the violence. Um, and pretty quickly after we, we served our discovery request in January of 2018, uh, all of a sudden cell phones started disappearing, social media accounts started getting deleted. Um, there was a pretty systematic, pretty widespread um, destruction of evidence across the board. Um, and so what we have been doing since January 2018, really for the better part of two and a half years, um, is fighting to, in court, um, to recover uh, as much as can be recovered and to the extent um, we're not able to recover pieces of evidence that have been destroyed to get sanctions against the defendants who destroyed the evidence. And we have been, I would say, pretty successful um, in recovering a lot of what was uh, attempted to be destroyed, but also getting sanctions against those defendants who, who um, are kind of the most egregious uh, offenders so far. So we've had, uh, I believe four, so far we've had four defendants sanctioned by the court. Uh, the sanctions range from attorney's fees to uh, court ordered depositions where we've been able to depose a number of people and kind of uncover where else things may exist. Um, all the way to incarceration, Elliot Klein was, was held in contempt of court um, and actually incarcerated for a period of time until he came closer to compliance, albeit not much closer, frankly. Um, uh, we just yesterday, uh, won another court order against Robert Asmador Ray, who was one of the um, leaders and kind of more vocal and violent uh, defendants. He, he has been non-compliant for the better part of a year and a half now uh, and was just ordered again by the court yesterday to turn everything over in short order uh, or face civil contempt like Mr. Klein um, faced. So um, that's basically where things stand right now is we are moving forward. We have had a number of, um, great victories in terms of getting sanctions or evidence that, that we were able to recover. Um, we are preparing right now to take the bulk of the defendant's depositions, which, uh, because of the pandemic will now be done over video depositions as opposed to in person. Um, and we have a trial date of October 26th, which we intend to keep and look forward to. And I think it's worth talking a bit about who these defendants are, because I suspect many people who are watching will know these names. It's folks like Richard Spencer, who coined the term alt-right, Andrew Anglin, who was sued for uh, elsewhere for harassment and tar uh, targeting violence at a Jewish real estate agent in Montana. Chris Cantwell, who many of you might know as the crying Nazi from the Vice documentary on Charlottesville. Elliot Klein, Matthew Heimbach, who has deep ties to a number of global neo-Nazi and white supremacist organizations. And then groups like the National Socialist Movement. Identity Europa, which has tried to change its name since the lawsuit. They now go by the American Identity Movement um, in an attempt to rebrand since facing the bad PR that came with being sued for planning a weekend of violence. Um, but we're, 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 of course, ensuring that they're held accountable despite their rebranding. The same thing goes for defendant Vanguard America, which since the violence has created an offshoot known as Patriot Front in another attempt to rebrand. But again, we're ensuring that those um, involved with Vanguard America who are responsible for the violence are held accountable. And it's important to understand who these defendants are 
because certainly they were responsible for what happened in Charlottesville and Mike alluded to much of this. And if you, I would really encourage folks to read the complaint, which is on Integrity First for America's website. And I'm sure the folks at the museum can also drop it into chat or we could drop it into chat. Um, it's at integrityfirstforamerica.org. If you click on our work in the Charlottesville case, you can read the lawsuit. And in it, you can read exactly what these defendants said in those discord chats that Mike referenced. They talked about, for example, Andrew England talked, literally said, we want a war. Defendant Ray, who Mike just mentioned, faced um, a really strong decision from the court yesterday recorded, requiring him to hand over remaining evidence, talks about how he's, quote, greatly outnumbered the anti-white, anti-American filth. We will have enough power. We will clear them from the streets. You ain't seen nothing yet. This is how these groups talked. And then there's one quote that I think um, I know sticks with many of us. They said, next stop Charlottesville, final stop Auschwitz. And so when Mike talks about how they were motivated by racism and anti-Semitism, this isn't hypothetical. It is truly at the core of everything that they believe and everything that they wrote in those planning chats were dripping with the sort of anti-Semitism and racism that you could only imagine and comes frankly straight out of Nazi Germany. And so certainly this case is about holding them accountable for their violence that they planned and ensuring that everyone who's responsible for planning and executing that violence is held to account. There have been very few actual charges brought in the aftermath of Charlottesville. You might know that James Fields, who drove the car, is now in jail for life. There's been a handful of other charges brought against some of those involved. But the broad leadership responsible for planning and executing this violence has not actually seen accountability here. And this case is the only effort to hold them accountable for what they did um, and to seek justice for those who were injured, um, 10 of whom are our plaintiffs. Um, Mike, it might be worth also talking about who our plaintiffs are, if you wanna run through that. Sure. Um, our, our plaintiffs are um, citizens of Virginia that came out uh, on August 11th and 12th to speak out against hate. Um, and they were uniformly peaceful protesters who were injured in some, in some sense, either Friday night, August 11th, as Amy talked about at the torchlight march through UVA, um, or on Saturday, a number of whom were hit by, the, by James Field's car. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's worth stressing um, just the level of bravery that they showed, not just um, coming out that night and that weekend to stand up against hate, but also to file the suit, to stick it out. Um, they too are looking forward to trial in October and, and have faced um, you know, some um, pressure and some threats um, for being involved in this. And they are just people who uniformly um, believe that uh, somebody needs to stand up to, to what happened, um, and, and they're doing that. I, I thought it might be worth, and I think I saw a, a chat to this effect, discussing a, briefly the defenses um, that, that the defendants have raised in this case, and specifically um, the First Amendment, which is, which is their primary defense, generally speaking, what, what they say is that they have a right to express their views, however odious, um, which we agree with, um, and that that's all that they were doing that, that weekend, and that what they did is they came out, they planned to express themselves, um, and that, you know, what, what happened, what really happened that weekend, according to them, is that they were basically attacked for their views, and that everything that they, that the, the, all the violence that, that eventuated that weekend by them was done in self-defense. And so it's a sort of combination of First Amendment kind of self-defense defense. Um, I think it's really important for us to stress that our case as we view it is not about the First Amendment um, and that we too believe passionately that anybody, including white nationalists, have the right to express themselves and that um, however odious their views, they have that right. And, it, and if 
what they had actually done that weekend was really just come to Charlottesville and, and wave their flags and chant their chants, um, there wouldn't be a lawsuit. But that's not what happened. And um, what we are focused on exclusively is the violence. And to the extent there's any um, speech that is wrapped up in our complaint, um, it is speech that um, occurred in the context of planning the violence, um, which is not itself protected by the First Amendment. Um, and so we have all the way through have been very careful to focus on um, violence, speech that is planning violence, um, and to, it, to make quite clear that this case is not about the First Amendment. Um, we believe that the defendants have a right to wave whatever flag they want. Um, the problem here is that they use those flags to beat people. And that, of course, is not protected by the First Amendment. And that was a um, one of their primary arguments in their motion to dismiss was that everything they did this weekend was protected by the First Amendment and the, um, the judge sided with us. And if you'd like to read that decision from the court, it's also on the website that I put in the chat. So if you navigate to our website to the Charlottesville case page, which is the link there, um, you can read the court's decision rejecting the defendant's motion to dismiss, which makes crystal clear that the First Amendment does not protect their right to plan and execute violence, as Mike just laid out. Um, I also think um, it's worth noting, um, and I see some comments in the chat to this effect, that some folks are asking about the destruction of evidence. And I know um, I know Robbie Kaplan, who is one of the other lead counsels alongside Mike and, and our team, likes to say that we could go to trial right now if we needed to. Um, and that's part of the, I don't want to say benefit, but that's part of the unique nature of this case in which so the entire conspiracy was planned online. And so even... There, I think it's fairly unique to file a, a case like this and a complaint as long and detailed as ours, which is frankly really the best history of what actually went down in Charlottesville in August 2017 is our lawsuit. Um, and the reason we were able to do that so quickly is because of those chats that came out in the aftermath of the violence. A nonprofit journalistic outfit called Unicorn Riot released these hack ch chats um, that had been um, sort of leaked in the aftermath of the violence. And those chats, which we now have in usable format for trial, are the basis of our suit and provide so much evidence of the violence that they plan. That's not to say that the evidence that Mike and our team have been tirelessly fighting for isn't also critical to the case. But those chats, those discord chats that lay bare their intent to bring violence to Charlottesville to quite literally hit protesters with cars and the animus that motivated it all um, is in our complaint in great detail. And so again, I would really encourage folks to read that. I don't know if you wanna add anything, Mike. No, I mean, I think that, yeah, I think that covers it. In some sense, we caught a lucky break in the beginning that Discord was hacked and released. Um, and I think it's important to mention that the defendants believed that Discord was a private invite only server. Um, and so they thought they had cover, um, which is why in a lot of, a, a lot of them spoke much more freely about what they wanted to do that weekend. Um, and so from the very beginning, when we brought the case, it was clear that it was well supported by, um, by exactly the, the content that, that Amy talks about. Um, but we, it is also true that throughout the course of discovery, um, there has been a lot more that has emerged on cell phones and other social media accounts and other forms of evidence. So, and so I, you know, I mentioned earlier that of course this case at its core is about winning justice for our plaintiffs and ensuring that the defendants face accountability. 
But it's also important to understand this case in the much broader cycle of white supremacist violence in recent years, because you can't look at what happened in Charlottesville without looking at everything else that we've experienced before and after, from Charleston to Wisconsin, um, this attack, attack on a Sikh temple, attack on an African-American church in Charleston, to the subsequent attacks after Charlottesville, from Pittsburgh to Christ Church to Poway to El Paso, and now during coronavirus, this alarming rise in extremism. And what we see over and over again is the deep connection that exists between these attacks and frankly, the ways in which um, the defendants in our suit truly are at the center of this much larger movement. So that by taking them on in this case and bankrupting and dismantling them through these large civil judgments that our team intends to win at trial this fall, we can have ripple effects that impact the white nationalist movement in America and on a global basis and go well beyond Charlottesville. So it's worth understanding some of these connections. For example, we know that the Pittsburgh shooter who killed 11 at Trio Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh a year and a half ago communicated on Gab, which is another right-wing social media site, with some of the Charlottesville leaders before his attack. We know that the Christ Church shooter who killed dozens of Muslims praying in mosques um, about a year ago in New Zealand painted onto his gun a symbol known as the Fash Tag, which was first popularized by another one of our defendants, Matthew Heimbach. That same symbol was found at the arson attack at the Highlander Civil Rights Center here in the States. And then we know that the Christ Church shooting inspired Poway and uh, El Paso and so many of these other attacks in which we really see a cycle of violence in which each white supremacist attack is used to inspire the next one. And in fact, just last week, we saw um, that there were some white supremacists in Queens, New York arrested who actually cited Charlottesville in talking about their intent to bring a race war. And so we see the cycle of violence at play firsthand. And certainly during coronavirus, that's only increased. Um, I know the museum has been focused on this topic. I was fortunate to join a panel last month on the rise of hate during extremism with Assemblywoman now from Chinatown in New York. Um, and we talked about the rise in anti-Asian attacks. We've talked about the rise of anti-Semitic conspiracy theories and Islamophobic conspiracy theories. Um, and very soon, very quickly, much like we saw in Charlottesville, we see these conspiracy theories turn into real world violence in which white supremacists try to turn the virus into a bioweapon as was reported a few months ago, in which a white supremacist who was actually a member of one of our defendants national socialist movement tried to bomb a hospital in Missouri that was treating coronavirus patients, in which another white supremacist tried to burn down a Jewish assisted living facility in Massachusetts the other week. And then many of us have seen these viral images of white supremacists and neo-Nazis at these anti-public health protests in which they hold signs that quite literally quote Nazi slogans are evocative of the gates of Auschwitz, compare governors who are implementing public health measures to the Nazis. One viral photo was a neo-Nazi holding a sign that had a rat with a yarmulke and a Star of David and it said Jews are the real plague. And as it turns out, he too was a member of one of our defendants, National Socialist Movement, and the ADL was able to track him to an NSM event last year with the would-be hospital bomber in Missouri. And so what we're seeing over and over again is the interconnectedness of this network, the ways in which each attack is used to inspire the next, and the opportunity we have through this case to go after those that are squarely in the center of this movement, take them on, hold them accountable in court, and bankrupt and dismantle them um, in ways that there frankly is no other game in town right now. There is no other case like this right now trying to do that. And so at IFA, we're so proud to support our plaintiffs in this case, not just because they deserve justice for what they live through, not just because those who are responsible should be brought to, uh, to should be held accountable, but also because we know their bravery in bringing this case will have ripple effects that go well beyond the Charlottesville community and send a clear message that there will be very severe financial and legal consequences for being parts of this, being a part of these violent conspiracies. Um, and there's so much more to say about this case. I know there are a number of questions in the chat. Perhaps it makes sense to leave it there for now and have Ari um, ask, raise some of these questions. Comments thus far, Mike and Amy, this is terrific. Um, and everyone who's been submitting questions, they're, they're phenomenal. We're trying to organize and bunch them a little bit to be able to get as many as possible. I want to start by asking about the defendants a little bit more. There, there, there is a lot of audience interest in that question. 
who's representing the defendants? Are any of them pro se? And who's financing the defendants? All great questions. Um, so a number of them are pro se. Um, Matthew Heimbach. And I might be explaining what that means for non-lawyers. Sorry. Yeah, I appreciate that. A, a number of them don't have lawyers. They re are representing themselves in this case. Um, Matthew Heimbach, Elliot Klein, Robert Ray, Chris Cantwell, um, so far, uh, the, there may be, there may be more, um, but so far a number of them represent themselves, which as you might imagine presents its own challenges. Um, the rest of them are, are, are represented by four or five lawyers who, uh, either represent individuals or, uh, or groups or a number of individuals and groups. Um, so there, there's a, a lot of personnel on the other side that um, creates challenges to, to deal with logistically. Um, in terms of who's financing it, um, by and large, it appears that they are raising money um, uh, and using um, this case, among other things, as a kind of rallying cry for it's, it's sort of a continuation of their general theory that um, that white people are oppressed and that the world is against them and and the government is um, you know is attacking white people and so um, so they they raise money um, a lot of um, crowd crowd funding on the internet um, there are there are sites called things like boy fund me um, uh, and similarly cleverly named platforms where they have been raising money. Um, but that's, and I will say, um, it, as is not entirely surprising, um, a, number of them, of, a number of their lawyers are also true believers. Um, one of whom said that he took on the case to oppose the Jewish influence in America. Um, one of them actually um, advertises himself as Nazi lawyer. Um, and so, um, so they are represented, not all of them, but, um, a number of them who have lawyers are represented by lawyers who are, who are believers in, in their cause. That's fascinating. And I must say, GoyFundMe is a new one, but <laughs> very troubling. Has the case, I mean, it, since, in the immediate aftermath of the events in Charlottesville, when the sort of scale of the damage became clear and Heather Heyer's life was lost, and then in the time since then, as you've been pursuing the case, have any of the plaintiffs expressed remorse? Uh, or do you think, do you think the case uh, has prompted anyone to rethink their behavior? When you say- The plaintiffs or the defendants? I'm sorry, uh, d defendants. Um, do you want, do you want, uh, I'm happy to start and, and kick it over to you, Amy. Um, but the short answer is yes, we think. Um, there have been, there certainly have been defendants that have expressed um, a kind of reformation in their views. I, I, I guess I, I guess I can't say anybody has re expressed remorse. There have been um, a couple of defendants who have purported to leave the movement. Um, and are now speaking out um, some, to some degree against um, white nationalism and hate generally. There are two in particular. Um, I, I have not heard either one express remorse. Um, and, and I will say that generally, to the extent there's any um, sort of bad feeling about what they've done or how they've um, spent their lives, it is, it is generally uh, articulated as, as trying to help other white nationalists from throwing their lives away by getting arrested for acts of violence. It, I have yet to hear any of them express any sort of remorse for the pain and trauma they have caused by, by the hate and their violence. But there have been two that have to leave the movement um, and there are a, a host of others that are in difficult financial straits because of this case 
Um, so we, we think it's had an effect. It's, I guess it remains to be seen how much. Yeah. Well, I think, I think I would say a few additional things there. And I totally agree with Mike that we have certainly not seen any remorse, even from those who now claim to be leaving the white nationalist and white supremacist movement. Um, there are a few things to note. There are some defendants who have not renounced the movement in any way, shape, or form, but have talked about the impact of this case and their ability to operate. Richard Spencer has said that the case is, quote, totally detrimental to his ability to operate. League of the South, one of the hate groups we're suing, um, said they were unable to open a new headquarters because of the case. We mentioned earlier Elliot Klein, who also goes by Eli Mosley, who was thrown in jail and sanctioned thousands of dollars in the case. So they're seeing very real financial and legal consequences already. Two defendants who were sanctioned last year, Jeff Scoop and Matthew Heimbach, have since claimed that they are leaving the white supremacist movement. Now, it's not on us to be the ones to decide whether they have truly abandoned their beliefs, because that's not what this case is about. This case is about their actions in August of 2017 and the planning that led up to it. But I do think that it's worth noting that if Mr. Scoop and Mr. Heimbach truly want to abandon the white supremacist movement and change, there's a way to do that, which is to comply with our plaintiff's discovery requests and the court orders and stop lying and tell the truth about what happened in Charlottesville in 2017. They have not done that. And so by not doing that, you know, I think it's fair for us to say anything less is a sham. And that in a country like this, which is predicated on the rule of law, they have a responsibility to comply with court orders, comply with the law, cooperate with the case, and take responsibility for what they did. And so while the fact that they have, um, you know, seemingly renounced their ways is important and perhaps indicative of the impact the case is having alongside some of the other examples I gave, we also believe that they and the, all the defendants must be held accountable for the violence they planned and executed in Charlottesville two and a half years ago. Absolutely. Let me ask about something you, you brought up again, um, and which has been a theme, which is the um, resistance to the discovery process. Uh, there are several questions that audience members have submitted about whether the government has been involved. Mark Zaid asked about uh, assistance from the U.S. government. Marilyn Reidler asked about the role of the city of Charlottesville, also about the role of UVA. Uh, can you talk a little bit about whether you're working, uh, to the extent that you can talk about it, whether you're working with the government, and if they're not involved in this suit, how else they are playing a role in the conversation? Sure. Um, yeah, and I guess I can't get too detailed into a lot of that. Um, I, I can say from the beginning, um, part of the reason that this suit is important is because generally the response to what happened in Charlottesville um, by government and law enforcement was insufficient. Um, and so um, James Fields was obviously prosecuted. There were a couple others that attended Charlottesville that, was, that were prosecuted. Um, um, there has been, we, we've gotten some cooperation in terms of, um, you know, litigating our case um, and some collaboration, but um, I, I would say on the whole, uh, we feel like our case is filling an important void. Totally. Now, what about uh, other legal groups like the Southern Poverty Law Center or the Anti-Defamation League? Have they been involved? Yeah. So, um there's a few, a few different uh, answers to that. The Anti-Defamation League uh, has formally partnered with us in this case in that they've invested $100,000 in the case and their Center on Extremism, which does really extraordinary research on white nationalism um, and extremism, um, is working with us both to help inform the case and clearly um, on this much broader crisis of rising extremism in America that we're both focused on. And so we are, uh, are formally partnering with them. The Southern Poverty Law Center um, is another group that does really important research on this front. And we, uh, in fact, I was actually going to share, they just published a piece a few days ago about the two defendants we were talking about a few moments ago, um, really looking at um, their role in Charlottesville and um, their, 
you know, their, their supposed renouncement of, of extremism now and um, whether that should be taken with a grain of salt or not. Um, and so we continue to work with them on um, ensuring that both their research informs our work at IFA and, and likewise that the case informs their very important research there. Um, and they too, actually, the SPLC brought a case against one of our defendants named Andrew Anglin um, in Montana, which I believe I mentioned earlier for his um, attacks against a Jewish woman there in, in I believe, Whitefish, Montana. Um, and so uh, we have certainly been partnering with them. I think folks often ask about the ACLU, which is conflicted out of the case because they secured the original permits for the Unite the Right rally, which as Mike has made perfectly clear, they had a right to have a rally. They didn't have a right to plan a weekend of violence. Um, and so the, while the ACLU can have a formal role in our case, we know that there are many lay leaders involved with the ACLU and others who have been publicly supportive of the case because they know, as Mike has outlined and as the court's decision rejecting the motion to dismiss makes clear that there's a clear line between First Amendment protected speech and conspiracies to commit violence. And this is certainly in the latter camp. Um, and so it's been heartening to see broad-based support for this case from a variety of folks. I think similarly, you know, when we have an event in DC, we see bipartisan support for this case, um, which is important. I think we can all agree, no matter what our politics are, that neo-Nazis don't have a right to bring violence to our streets and our communities. That should be a baseline for any, any American, regardless um, of their ideology, you would think. Um, but, uh, it has been, I think, heartening to see the broad-based support, um, and I, I hope that continues to grow. I'll, I, I think for, for many of our viewers, when thinking about the case in the context of politics, uh, President Trump's famous comments that there are fine people on both sides come to mind. Uh, you talk about the support being really bipartisan today for your efforts. Has, has that been true? throughout the last few years, how do you feel that the president's involvement has shaped the conversation that your case fits within? Well, I, I think, you know, I'm frequently asked the question about how, how did we get here? Like, how did we get to this moment in which white supremacists and neo-Nazis feel so emboldened? And I think there are two factors to understand here. And well, there's probably many factors to understand here, but two that jump out for me. One is, and we've talked about this a lot, is the role of social media. In the past, you've had Klansmen and other white supremacists sort of hindered by the fact that they could only plan violence in their communities, essentially. And so when the Ku Klux Klan Act, which is the central statute in our suit, um, was first conceived of almost 150 years ago, we were dealing with KKK members who were wearing white hoods in their clans den, in their clan dens in the South somewhere. Now, the only real difference is that instead of meeting in the woods, in their clan dens, they're able to meet on social media and plan and conspire violence there. And so in many ways, social media has become the clan den of the 21st century. And that has enabled these extremists to connect and plan violence in ways that they previously couldn't. And as I mentioned earlier, also inspire each other to action, use these white supremacist attacks to inspire the next one. And so that is certainly a factor that we need to understand that certainly predated President Trump um, and is important. However, you can't look at the last few years and not understand how emboldened these individuals feel and the role of our political leaders, including the highest political leader in the land in making them feel that way. And so what this suit does is make crystal clear that there are not fine people on both sides. These are not fine people. They very clearly plan to bring racist violence to the streets of Charlottesville. And we think by making that clear in a public jury trial and have these extremists held accountable by a jury of their peers, it will send a clear national message that we are dealing with a crisis of extremism in America. It is not acceptable to have this happen here and that there will be very real consequences if you are part of these efforts. Um, and so I think the short answer is there's so many factors at play here, but certainly both the rise of social media and the ways in which political leaders have emboldened these groups and these individuals can't be ignored as the two leading factors from my perspective. Thanks, Amy. Now, uh, when we talk about 
uh, social media, fueling, sort of providing new forums for planning and fueling this type of violence uh, makes me think of conspiracy theories, which we've gotten some questions about as well. Uh, unfortunately, they're, they're on the rise and they um, infect a lot of our political discourse today. Uh, I'm thinking of the recent reporting about the uh, already wide conspiracy theories about a potential coronavirus vaccine, you know, before it even exists yet. Can you talk about the specific conspiracy theories that have played a role in your suit? And then also, if you are willing to go beyond the legal aspects of the case, are you concerned about the sort of broader social decay that allows these conspiracy theories to flourish? And what do we do about that? You know, even if it's you know, past October, you, you win the case, but the theories are still out there. Do you want to start, Mike? Sure. Um, I think the primary conspiracy theory that, that motivates this case is the one that motivates the defendants um, that there is such a thing in America as white genocide. And that's, that's what motivates a lot of, um, or at least they say that's what motivates a lot of, of why they do what they do, um, that they believe that white people are being, you know, wiped off the face of the earth and that it's really important for them to stand up and fight back. Um, that is a conspiracy theory that lacks evidentiary basis, but, um, but fuels a lot of hate and a lot of violence. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, this case is an important antidote to that because one of the things, as Amy mentioned, that we want to do with this trial is bring to light what actually happened at Charlottesville, that there were not fine people on both sides, um, but, and that this was not a weekend of expression and, um, you know, First Amendment celebration. This was just a conspiracy to commit acts of terrorism. Um, and so, you know, one, I think one way you fight conspiracy theories, which I totally agree, um, unfortunately flourish um, in today's society, particularly given, given the ability to reach so many on the internet, um, is sunlight. Sunlight being the best disinfectant to say, you know, this, what happened um, this weekend in Charlottesville was, was just um, kind of, you know, I mean, complicated and sophisticated planning, but it was really a run-of-the-mill conspiracy to attack people. And just shedding light on that, hopefully, uh, and the consequences that flow from a jury verdict and judgment against these defendants, um, we hope and believe will have a, a big effect. And to, to expand on what Mike was talking about with, with replacement theory, which is the idea that, you know, there is this big conspiracy, unsurprisingly orchestrated by the Jews in their minds, to replace the white race, to commit white genocide. It's that same conspiracy theory that we see in so many of these subsequent white supremacist attacks. And so again, when we talk about the cycle of white supremacist violence, how each attack is used to inspire the next one, how these leaders fuel um, these social media chat platforms where this extremism festers and motivates people to action, it's these conspiracy theories that we see firsthand. We saw it, for example, in Pittsburgh, where that shooter chose that synagogue. They chose Tree of Life because they partner with Hyas, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, to support refugees coming to America. And this, the shooter there believed that that was part of this plan to replace the white race. We saw it in Christ Church in Poway, in El Paso, where you had a white supremacist drive 10 hours out of his way to target a Walmart in a predominantly Latino community. And so over and over again, we see this same conspiracy theory in its different forms. We're also seeing it now, as I think, Ari, you mentioned, um, during coronavirus, in which, you know, there are talks of the virus being a plan by the Jews to condense our power to, uh, to essentially, um, you know, do all sorts of crazy things in their minds. There's other theories at play as well, including something called accelerationism, which means, which is the idea that we should be targeting our infrastructure in order to sort of speed up the collapse of society as it exists and bring about a, essentially a white nation state. Um, and that's what we've also seen, especially right now with these white supremacists targeting infrastructure like hospitals. Um, and so it's important to understand the conspiracies that fuel 
these individuals and these groups because so often they turn into real world violence. And to Ari's point, they really are indicative of the ways in which conspiracies and disinformation can spread like wildfire fire on social media and the responsibilities the private sector and our government have in ensuring that doesn't happen. Given the similarities between so many instances, and, and not just similarities, but connections between so many of these instances of violence, do you expect that if you win, you will set a precedent around the use of the KKK Act of 1871 that could then be utilized in other cases? I hope so. Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we are seeking is an injunction. Um, and the other thing that we, I think we are achieving is um, a huge financial disincentive um, to get together and conspire, um, which, what, let me just say, while we're talking about conspiracy theories, um, legally speaking, a conspiracy um, is just an agreement. Um, it's an agreement to do something illegal, frankly. Um, and so, um, and that's what we need to prove under the KKK Act. That's what we think happened in Charlottesville. And so hopefully the precedential effect is that, um, you know, if you get together and, with somebody else and you agree with somebody else to do something violent or illegal um, against a person or a community or a population, um, we hope that the, the effect of our suit is that at a minimum, you will think twice um, or, or, or hopefully not do it. So um, hopefully- and We're already seeing that, right? Like that. we had some of the defendants in our suit say that they weren't going to return to Charlottesville in 2018 because they didn't want to be sued again. And that's a good thing. The deterrent effect is already happening before we even get to trial and some of the other examples we talked about. And when we win these large judgments and chase them around for the rest of their lives to collect on them, that will send a very powerful message and set that very clear legal precedent. That's powerful. I, since we just have seven minutes or so left, I, I wanna close with a few questions about how to watch the trial, what comes next. Um, but before we do, I'm gonna ask something much more specific. We've had many questions saying, is the defendant Elliot Klein Jewish? And are there other uh, defendants who are Jewish or sort of have Jewish connections? Do we know? I do not believe that he's Jewish. I understand the question, um, but I have not heard that he's Jewish. He certainly says some of the most foul and violent things I've ever heard um, said about Jewish people. Um, so I, I don't think he's Jewish. Um, I don't think any of the defendants are. I, I will say that one of their um, that they, they so, some, some basis for infighting amongst them is when um, one of them suspects that one of the other ones has some sort of Jewish connection and then they go after each other for that. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I don't know what their um, religious affiliation is, but I, I certainly, um, I don't believe any of them are Jewish. And they certainly don't like the fact that this effort is being led by a number of people that includes Jews. Um, and they make that known to us and to their followers online. And frankly, it's one of the reasons security is the biggest expense in IFA's budget, because no matter if they might have Jewish heritage in their past, they have no qualms about threatening um, and encouraging their followers to threaten and attack uh, Jewish Americans and others. And Amy, I'm thinking about you being the, it's the granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, right? Which is just another particularly powerful element of the broad coalition that's pursuing this. Yeah, so, I think, um, sorry, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. I was just gonna say, you know, for me, one of the things that is, you know, it's, it, it's, I hope this wasn't too depressing of a talk. And I do think that there is reason for optimism. And for me, one of the reasons to have optimism here is that unlike in my grandparents' generation in, the, in Europe in the 30s and 40s, we live in a country that's based on the rule of law. We live in a country where we have a justice system that is meant to protect us and that we have, we have plaintiffs, brave plaintiffs and lawyers like ours that are willing to use those laws and use that justice system to protect us. And that gives me some reason for optimism here that we can fight back, that we are fighting back um, and that we will 
send a very clear message with this uh, trial this fall. So how can those of us who are interested best follow the trial? And do you expect that it'll be held in person given coronavirus? Do you want to start with the second question, Mike, and then sure. jump in? Um, I certainly, we really certainly hope so. Uh, and we are moving forward as if, um, as if we are going to have the trial in person in October. Um, we're gathering all the evidence we can. We're taking depositions by video now. Um, some of them. Um, and we hope to be in Charlottesville in October. And there, so far, there's no indication from the court that we won't be. I think it obviously ha depends on what happens with coronavirus and um, how things develop. But, but we certainly hope and plan to be in Charlottesville October 26th, starting trial. Um, and how to follow the trial, um, regardless of whether it happens this fall or not. But as Mike said, we are committed to doing everything we can to ensure it does. Um, you can sign up at integrityfirstforamerica.org. We'll put that um, that website in the chat as well, um, so everyone has it uh, front and center. And there you could sign up for case updates. We will be sending regular updates ahead of trial. Um, you can also follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram. Um, and then, of course, as we get towards trial, we'll be sending what I, what I assume to be daily updates of what happens in court, um, everything else relevant here. There will certainly be no shortage of news on this front, I'm fairly confident. I'm also fairly confident that this trial um, will be well covered by local and national media, given the importance of it to our national conversation and to the crisis that we're facing as a country. Um, I would also encourage folks to get involved more broadly, sign up for case updates, spread the word to your family and friends. We have a clergy toolkit on our website and an activist toolkit on, your, on our website, which you could download and use to share social media content. If you are a rabbi or other clergy member, you could use it to give a sermon to your community, a virtual sermon, I assume right now. Um, and we're doing, uh, we think in particular clergy is so important given that houses of worship have been on the front lines of these attacks in so many cases, including in Charlottesville, as we saw with the synagogue and the interfaith vigil there. Um, and um, so sign up for those case updates. If you have the ability to donate right now, um, please do. It directly supports the case, the security costs, the evidence collection costs that we've described. Um, and spread the word. We are. Um, we think it's so important that people know that this case is happening. It's so easy to feel scared and angry and frustrated right now, but this is a very concrete and tangible thing that is happening that um, people can get involved with the fight back against rising anti-Semitism and rising extremism in this country. And you can do so by simply spreading the word to your family and friends, sharing on social media, donating if you can, signing up. Um, if you are interested in hosting a virtual event in your community with your synagogue or church or mosque or whatever it is, reach out to us on our website and let us know. Um, but again, this is a really concrete, tangible thing that people can do to fight back against rising anti-Semitism and racism and hate right now. Um, and we're really grateful that folks took the time out of their days to learn about it and will hopefully continue being part of this effort. Well, thank you so much, Amy and Mike, for educating us. <clears throat> and uh, giving us a little window into the hard work that you do every day. For all of you who are attending, we will send a uh, post-program follow-up email linking to Integrity First for America's website and some other resources. And we will post a recording of the program to YouTube. So please feel free to, to share that uh, if you found it of interest. Lastly, I just want to mention that the museum has a full roster of public programs about contemporary anti-Semitism and other topics. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, historian and curator Robert Jan Van Pelt will give a lecture about Auschwitz and its contexts exclusively for museum members. And on Thursday evening, we're hosting Esther Safran Foer and her son Jonathan Safran Foer to discuss her new book, I Want You to Know We're Still Here, a post-Holocaust memoir. Information about these programs uh, and everything else that we do is on the museum's website. So without further ado, thank you again, Amy and Michael, for all the important work you're doing and for sharing a piece of it with us. Uh, we'll be eagerly watching in October and wish you the best of luck. Thank Thanks you so much, Ari. Thanks, Thanks so much to everybody. To everybody. Take care, everyone.